I'm so excited to bring you our third live interview with one of the wonderful individuals we've met along the journey of making and screening the film Medicating Normal. First, before we get to our special guest, I just want to take a minute to announce that we have built a Medicating Normal store with t-shirts and stickers. The store will only be available for three more weeks, so if you haven't had a chance to order, please do it. Maybe listen to the broadcast while you go do it. But we're just trying to do like a, a small fun, fundraising drive for the fall because we're paying we're paying a lot of expenses. Right now we're focused on getting the film translated into different languages. We just completed Portuguese, Spanish. We're working on Czech, C-Z-E-C-H, and uh, Hebrew is this week. And each one is like three to $500 each. So if we just need a little bit of help from the community, uh, people that support us. So if you, if you get a chance, either um, go to the store and buy a t-shirt or a sticker or go make a donation on our website. We cannot do it without you. So we really appreciate that. So moving on to our guest today, it's Alto Strada. Hi, Alto. Hello. She is, uh, she's a survivor of prolonged paroxetine withdrawal syndrome and the founder of Surviving Antidepressants. Anti SurvivingAntidepressants.org was founded in 2011 and is an all online peer support group for people taking and discontinuing psychiatric drugs. There are currently more than 15,000 registered members 56,000 visitors per month and 270,000 page, page views per month. I'm going to start off the conversation with just a few questions to get us started, but then we're gonna to move to the audience. So Facebook Live, if you have a question, you can type it in the comment box below. And, um, oh, and lastly, I just would like to say this conversation should not be taken as medical advice and that you should always consult with people that are informed and safe, safe deprescribing. So first, let's go to Alto. Can you tell us a little about how you came to be prescribed an antidepressant, why you decided to come off, and what you knew back then about tapering and healing? Uh, okay. Um, well, going back to maybe 2001, um, I was working in a, um, a, a tech company. Uh, there were a lot of stresses back then because of the dot-com crash. And I was feeling a lot of work stress. I was probably also going through uh, pre-menopause. And, um, uh, and later on, I, I found out that uh, I was low in B12. So I don't, that may or may not have anything to do with it. Um, so... Um, so I went to my GP and I said, you know, I'm feeling a lot of work stress. Uh, I want to be able to hang on to my job, but it seems to be, everything seems to be going sideways and this is really hard. And, uh, and she said, well, I can give you an antidepressant. They're all alike. How about this? And she, she gave me a prescription for Paxil. So I took, uh, 10 milligrams of Paxil for um, a couple of years. And, uh, and I had uh, probably the usual side effects. You know, I definitely got uh, the um, sexual dysfunction, which is very common. Um, and as, as time went on, I began to get more and more sluggish and demotivated and just feeling blah. And I decided that, uh, and then by that time I'd lost my job, <laughs> the company had gone under. And um, I um, thought that I would come off of it. And uh, so I, uh, I, I was really feeling that it was, it, was, it was slowing me down. I mean, it was making me feel very, very sluggish. And it's possible. I, I don't recall if I gained weight then or not, but that's possible that I that I was also gaining weight. And um, so I, my GP said, um, "Well, I, uh, I, I, my GP was not on my insurance plan at that point." And she said, "Well, it doesn't make any sense for you to come to me for your." refills because um, you'll have to pay for it. So why don't you see a doctor that's on your plan? So I thought, well, okay, great. So I went to a psychiatrist who was on my plan 
which is the first psychiatrist I saw. And he turned out to be like maybe the worst doctor in the world. And uh, he was only interested in um, doing a med 15 minute med check and giving me a prescription refill. And so I said to him, um, you know, I'm feeling that Paxil is slowing me down and make me feel real sluggish and lazy. And he went, ha, 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 that's what's making you feel lazy. Because that's the kind of guy he was. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And he said, uh, and I said, you know, and, and I mentioned the sexual dysfunction. He said, how about Lexapro? It doesn't have that side effect, which was not true. Uh, so he, he, I said, well, how should I do the switch? And he said, well, you just stop taking Paxil and you take Lexapro the next day. So I did that. And I got, of course, the most horrible uh, Paxil withdrawal plus the Lexapro was too strong for me. Lexapro is a stronger antidepressant than Paxil. And, um, and so I had uh, what was probably serotonin toxicity for pro I mean, a couple of weeks. And I, and I went back to him and I said, something is going wrong. This is not, you know, this, I, this, this is um, not good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, when I made that change, something terrible really happened. And he, he threw me out of his office. He said, well, you know, I don't want to see you anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, well, can you at least give me a refill on my Paxil prescription? So I started taking Paxil again. And, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't, even though I felt better than I had been, um, I, um, I, didn't feel, I didn't feel right. I, I, there was still something very much wrong. And uh, so I saw another psychiatrist and, she, and I said, I need to go off of this. And she didn't know anything about how to go off of it. So I ended up going to the, um, I live very close to a major medical center and uh, uh, university at University of California, San Francisco. And I went to their outpatient clinic and, uh, and I asked them, okay, I want to go off of Paxil. You know, I told them that I had these problems, but they seemed to think that I needed to stay on it because of potential relapse. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I said, how do I go off it? And they went, oh, well, you just go off it over a few weeks, you know? So, so I went, okay, so that must be easy. So, you know, I, I looked at, I looked at some, you know, I saw some web pages that said something about cutting the dose in half and then in half again. And I did that and I went off of it over a few weeks. And that was in October of 2004. Um, and, uh, and I started to feel great. I mean, I felt fantastic. I had this enormous surge of energy. I was, I went, wow, you know, this is like, you know, this really fixed me up. Of course, I was also sweating and I had brain zaps. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so I had this period of hypomania for, for about a month or so. Wow. And, and then I slid into what is conventional um, withdrawal syndrome. So mm -hmm. I, I Oh, Paxil withdrawal syndrome from that point. And, and I was seeing the, you know, I went up to the to UCS staff for my appointments and I, you know, and I, and I told them what was happening and they didn't catch on. And, um, uh, and then finally, when I, when I went into the crash phase, I went up there and I said, I have Paxil withdrawal. By that time, I had figured it out and I uh, was um, Googling and as much as we could Google back then, I think I use Google. It might have been a different search engine, but the um, I uh, had found um, journal articles about antidepressant withdrawal syndrome, and I had found journal articles about paroxetine withdrawal syndrome in particular. And I printed them out, and I talked, and I went to the UCSF people, and I said, "This, you know, this is what's going on," and they went, "Well, you know." Who knows? You know, why don't wow. you why don't you try this Wellbutrin? So, uh, so I took Wellbutrin for a while, and it it caused blood pressure spikes and these like incredible 
you know, electrical surges, which people probably will recognize that these yeah. like anxiety surges. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went, oh, this isn't good. So I stopped taking that. So, so, uh, so I said to them, you know, uh, why in, in the papers, it said to reinstate the, the drug when you get withdrawal syndrome. And I, and I said, well, can I take Paxil again? And they refused to, they refused to prescribe it for me. The wow. next thing they offered me was Cymbalta. And by that time I went, no, too much. You yeah. Know what you're doing. yeah. So, well, I didn't actually say that to them, but I really should have. Um, but, 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 but at that time, I believed that, you know, that uh, doctors really knew, you know, that they had the answer somehow, even though that, even though the psychiatry department at the University of California, San Francisco, which is one of the top medical centers in the world, didn't have a clue. I thought somebody had a clue. So, yes. so then I started looking for somebody. I mean, I was, I had withdrawal syndrome. I was still working though. I, you know, I pulled myself together. Um, I was, um, I was getting, I, I was sleeping some. I was getting like maybe three or five hours of sleep a night. Um, but I was zapping. I had brain zaps for seven months. I was zapping. I was sweating. I was like disoriented. I was, um, uh, I had surges of anxiety or, you know, as pe people will understand when I say anxiety, I'm not talking about garden variety anxiety, but this like chemical, physical, yes, chemical, physical surges and, uh, and, um, uh, so I started, you know, I started, uh, by that time I was months into it. Um, and I also was seeing, an, you know, I, I went to a, a, a really, uh, I, I was seeing a private psychiatrist too, and we were having these discussions and I kept on saying, you know, and again, I guess I showed him the papers and I said, this is what's going on. Um, and um, and he, 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 I don't know why I was paying him because he would, he, would, he was trying to convince me that I was deluded. So, 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 so I, so I, I, <laughs> I know, I know, I look back on it and I think, oh my goodness, it's so silly. But I, you know, so, so I went to my appointments for seven months with him. And finally I said, you know, I really don't like this dynamic. And he said, what dynamic? And I said, this dynamic where I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell you what's going on with me and you keep on telling me that I'm, di I'm deluded. And he was very surprised. And I just, you know, I said, you know, this, this is our last meeting. So I said, so I ended that, but then I, you know, I was looking, I, I spent four years looking for some, for, for a doctor who would like, you know, now that I look back on it, it seems foolish, but somebody who would help me. Yeah. And I contacted dozens, of, dozens of doctors um, because you know I live a few blocks from a medical center, and they have a psychiatry department that's you know probably has 150 doctors, 150 psychiatrists on it. Some of them call themselves psychopharmacologists, and they supposedly know everything there is to know about the drugs. And they all told me that I had relapsed, which was ridiculous because I. I didn't have anything that you would call. Yeah. There's like, nothing to relapse for because yeah, you just had work stress. I had yeah. bizarre symptoms and, uh, and I had never been disoriented. I, I was, I was, I was, you know, I had depersonalization and, and, and uh, disorientation and, you know, and I would walk around. I mean, there were, there were times that I, I, I've lived in my neighborhood for decades and there were times that I would walk around and I would like, you know, I, I would not, I, I really, I mean, I knew where I was, but I could not yeah. recognize, I didn't have the sense of recognition of where I was. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, this happened a couple of times when I was driving, and I was like, uh, this is, you know, it was a really kind of scary moment of, yeah, you know, a moment of real fear there. So, um, so uh, you know, this went on for years. I, I you know, I, I was reading. You know, I, again, I, I went up to the medical library at the school. I was because stuff was not on the internet. A lot of stuff wasn't on the internet then. So I actually looked it up in books. And um, so I, uh, 
anybody who had written a paper of an antidepressant withdrawal, I was corresponding with all of these, wow. uh, these you know, people, all over, do, uh, doctors all over the world who had written these articles. And of course, without seeing me, they all said that I had relapsed. And uh, it seems incredible to me that people, that that, that would be the assumption. You so know, wait, we, they, they believed in withdrawal, but only to a certain point. And then if you were past that point, you were actually relapsing. Exactly. Got Any it. past a few weeks was considered to be relapse, whatever it was. And just for people in the audience, if you don't know what relapse means, it means it's a reemergence of the symptoms you went on the drug for. So if you have major depression, you withdraw off the drug, and then you would have what's called a relapse if your major depression came back after coming off the drug or your bipolar got worse, or instead of saying it could be a withdrawal symptom from coming off the drug. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. They, yeah, so this went on for years uh, and um, um, it, it, it's just, it, it, it's still, it, it's still pretty, pretty it still amazing. happens, yeah. yeah. Doctor, you know, I, I corresponded with one very, very prominent author in the, uh, I guess you'd call it the withdrawal space, um, Richard Shelton. And uh, he wrote me back and he said, some people can have these very long withdrawal effects. And then he went on to explain that um, what I actually was suffering was PTSD from, I don't know exactly what it was I was suffering PTSD from, I guess, some, yeah. you know, the, the shock of having gone off of my drug, which seems a little strange to me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, anyway, so, so I did get, so, so now Richard Shelton is, uh, as I said, extremely prominent in uh, the, in, as an author in the uh, journal articles about withdrawal and um, he, he knew about it. So, you know, so that said to me, because the, all the journal articles were saying that withdrawal only lasts a few weeks. And so he had written some of them. Uh, and I, that sort of gave me a clue that that wasn't really the whole story. So, so I joined, uh, as people do, um, after, you know, after a year of withdrawal syndrome, I joined an online support group, which was uh, paxilprogress.org at that point. Uh, and I was a member there for, I think about five years. Uh, yeah, that would be about right, around five years um, until that uh, online community declined. And then I started my own website. So, sorry. So that takes us to our next question. And I just want to be mindful. We're almost halfway through our time. Oh no. So we have to kind of hurry a little bit with the next questions. And we have a couple questions in the queue from the audience. So let's try it. I don't know. It's hard because I, I could talk to you all day, but let's maybe answer shorter, maybe, I guess. I don't know. I hate to tell you to do that. Gosh. Okay. But yeah, we're, we're at 122 already. We only have uh, 38 minutes left. Oh okay. no. I know. So, and I want us to get to them because they're so good. Okay. So second question is, so, and that leads us to how did you come to found survivingantidepressants.org? Well, as I said, the, you know, packs of progress declined. Um, one of the issues there was that they decided for reasons of their own, that they weren't going to support people who had uh, prolonged withdrawal syndrome. So, uh, so some of those people, uh, they wanted an online community and uh, and I more or less had the capacity to do it. So I started uh, this this little website. So uh, those those were became the founding members, some of the people that had um, were, had been kicked off of Paxil Progress wow. as, as I had. Can, but. can you tell people a little bit about surviving antidepressants? Somebody that has never seen it, who's never searched for you, what does the website do exactly? Well, it's a, um, it's a forum website, which means that the content is in topics that people contribute to. And uh, it is, what we do is we provide peer support for primarily for tapering off the drug. Um, we have a tapering section that has uh, about 60 topics having to do with tapering specific types of drug. 
Um, so if you want, uh, for instance, tip, tips for tapering Zoloft or tips for tapering effects, sir, we have um, topics about that. Uh, and so, so I conceived it, of it as a very straightforward, you know, here are the facts about how you can divide up your doses. Um, also, we present the, uh, a, um, a hyperbolic tapering method of 10% per month calculated on the last dosage, which means that your, your, the amount of your dosage gets, the amount of your dosage decrease keeps getting smaller as you go on to keep it proportionate to your total dose. This, this allows your nervous system to gra very gradually adapt to a diminishing amount of the drug. Um, however, uh, people who, are, who have protracted withdrawal syndrome also are uh, a part of our community and we support them as best as we can, although we don't know any cures for protracted withdrawal syndrome. Uh, sometimes people do find that if they take a small amount of the drug again, and a very, when I'm saying a very small amount, perhaps one milligram or so, um, that it help, actually helps protracted withdrawal syndrome. So, so, uh, so we support people who are tapering and are also recovering from withdrawal syndrome. Wow. And yeah, I think it's really revolutionary because um, in absence of medical help, people have gone online and they've created their own wisdom and their own ways of tapering. It's almost like the anthropology of psychiatric drug withdrawal, like all these, there's an, they have their own language. They have, uh, you know, people share diet tips and sleep hygiene and coping skills and meditation and try this one and try that one. It's, it's, it's almost like its own I said it on the on the last discussion. It's an underground of people that are helping each other. And I, go ahead. What subculture? Yeah, subculture. Yeah. And in fact, recently, um, I, I signed back into surviving antidepressants to help another military veteran, but I hadn't been on there, you know, in, in several years. And I went back and searched through my first post, and I found that it was like 10 years ago, looking for Yes, I couldn't believe it. I don't even remember this, but it was, it went back 10 years and it was me asking advice about tapering Cymbalta and that I had taken the little grounds out, you know, and, and counted the capsules, which I had been doing. A friend told me to do that in absence of medical help. I didn't know any about anything really about the group, but that, that morning, I guess, apparently I had put it in some water and drank it. And I was afraid that, oh my God, it's going to hit my system and do something to me, you know, and so I had logged in to say, I'm tapering Cymbalta. This is how I'm doing it. A friend told me how to do it. And am I going to die because I drink it, you know? <laughs> and of course, a bunch of people swooped in to say, no, 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 you'll be fine. You know, but yeah, people don't usually taper that way. But I just thought that was fascinating. Look at my trajectory since 10 years, you know? I hope that we told you that you had to take the, you know, take those little beads whole because yeah. Yeah. If you dissolve them, it destroys the drug and you yeah. don't. That's exactly what, yes, that's exactly what I was told. Yeah. So that was interesting. So question three. Okay. This is my favorite. This is why I want to talk to you so much because on Twitter, there's quite an active community of people that have tapered off antidepressants or benzos or antipsychotics, and they try to interact with medical providers and researchers. And usually it doesn't go very well. <laughs> Either side is usually not listening to the other because, you know, there's a lot of pain and a lot of anger in our community, right? So yeah. I see you being a bridge builder where you are more diplomatic, you can quote studies, you know the research better than any lay person that I know. So can you tell me a little bit about, have you had any like victories, any pushback well, that, um, just in your advocacy in general? It's pretty funny because I do try to be fair. That's, <laughs> that's, that's one of my big character flaws is I'm always trying to be fair, but the, uh, as, as much as I attempt to be fair, I'm not fair enough for a lot of those psychiatrists. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so they lump me in with the, you know, with the hostile anti-psychiatry people anyway. Yeah, and we're not anti, well, right. No matter right. what you're, it, it, it is definitely, a, I, Twitter, Twitter is a funny little universe. It's, and it, it, it's, you know, whether, is it representative or is it not representative? It's 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 really hard to tell. I mean, the, the population of doctors 
on Twitter may or may not be representative of doctors as a whole. Um, as it turns out, it seems as though a, many more of the British psychiatrists are on Twitter than uh, US psychiatrists. And um, they, they actually seem to be a little bit more open to interacting with the, uh, with the patients on Twitter. Uh, but, uh, but they're, you know, I, the doctors on Twitter really want to talk to other doctors and they want to talk to their friends. They're like anybody else. They don't right. want to, really they don't want to fight. Yeah. Confronted by strangers. And, um, I can certainly understand that, but, um, if they're talking about tapering or prescribing drugs or something, uh, sometimes I will, you know, I will pop in now, you know, paradoxically, um, although, um, I cannot say that my interactions with doctors tend to result in any kind of um, conversion on either side. I, 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 ha I have to, uh, you know, I hope that if I give them information that it gets, you know, like it makes them think somehow. And I do think, you know, I do believe that feedback from patients, I mean, you know, doctors are armored against feedback from patients, but they hear it. I mean, you know, they might be thinking about it as they're driving home. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do have actually quite a few MDs among my followers on Twitter. So th there are people who are, who, who want to hear what I have to say, or at least are curious about what's going on in the patient community. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, the very best doctors really want to know what's going on with patients. They want to know, they want to know how patients are, um, perceive their treatments and how they, uh, you know, and, and how they're affected over time. And, uh, and they're looking for tips also. Um, and I do from time to time post about particular studies or uh, other articles that, that are, I, I, they might find informative. So they may be following me for that. That's great. Yeah, I think that's part of a, uh with the film, you know, is creating this dialogue in the community. But the thing that I've noticed off of um, the community screenings when we were doing them in person was it's the it was the first time you could see patients, nurses, ex-patients, parents, teachers, professors, and prescribers in the same room who had just watched the same film. And it was almost like the power differential was evened. So we're all having this discussion and what do we think? And I mean, I've had prescribers stand up and cry and say, I didn't know what I was prescribing. I had no idea. Just like a, two weeks ago on a virtual screening, a doctor said, you know, like, I know I have patients, but like this really, this film really brought to light that they have lives and they have long-term consequences. And so there must be some kind of, when you see, you know, 10 patients a day, you don't think like they have a life and when are they going to come off the drug and what is this going to do to them 10 years from now? We don't follow people that, that long. So anyway, I, I just think the dialogue is so important. If, if we're going to change this issue, how do we, how do we do that? I think especially in the mental health field, because it's a, it also has to do with uh, psychiatric treatment also affects people's sense of themselves. Right. Which you know, it's beyond the effects of the drugs. Uh, I mean, really, if you, when you become a psychiatric patient, you are entering into a culture. It's it's an, it's another subculture, which you I mean, you can see that conflict on Twitter too, because oh, yeah. there are yes, yes, yes. patients who are very very committed to their drug treatment. Yeah, patients who are yeah. very enchanted with their drug treatment. Yeah. So and, and then like doctor as the expert and patient as you don't, you couldn't possibly know what's good for you or what's really going on. And I'm the expert and only I know, and I hold all that knowledge. Yeah. Well, that's pretty appalling when you see that in, uh, you know, in print, isn't it? So, uh, but yeah, that exists as well. Uh, the fact is, is that somebody needs to know something, you know, it's, it's, um, we're, we all, uh, we, we are all, we are, even if we were living in tribal societies, there would be some uh, some individuals among us who would be considered to have to have certain types of wisdom in certain in certain areas. Yeah. So so we do respect wisdom. The problem, I think, for um, psychiatry and psychiatric treatment with uh, drugs and with ECT is that there's been a a real um, 
pa uh, some patients have become extremely disenchanted. They've experienced the treatment and it's not delivering the way that it's described and right. want the practitioners to know about that. And I think that it is important that for the practitioners to know uh, because otherwise they're just practicing in a black box, you know, they're, they're, it's like, you know, they, they hand you the drugs and they don't know what happens afterwards. So right. it's important for them to know that it's not always a good outcome and they really need to know how to reduce the bad outcomes. They're not inevitable. These are avoidable errors that are occurring. Mm, that's such a good way to say it. Thank you for articulating that so well. Okay, so last question, then we're gonna to move to audience questions. I know you're very interested in writing papers about withdrawal and have recently helped Dr. Mark Horowitz, who will be a guest here in two weeks uh, with his withdrawal survey in the UK. Can you tell me a little bit about, about the research you've done over all these years and maybe what is coming down the pipe soon? Well, I, um, I feel that uh, the last few years we've come to a bit of a tipping point in our subculture. Uh, in that there are some, some doctors who've experienced this withdrawal phenomenon and have become very much convinced that it needs to be brought to uh, the attention of the medical community. Um, so, uh, so they, uh, it, there, uh, last year we, there was a meeting in Sweden where many of us met and out of that has come some papers um, which are slowly being published um, that, uh, you know, they get fed into the hopper of general medical knowledge and they help perhaps change the averages, right? So the, the preponderance of papers now are uh, having to do with, let's say, antidepressant withdrawal claim that it lasts only a few weeks. Uh, well, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Davies and Reed wrote a paper that demonstrated that the, uh, the withdrawal was much more frequent and probably lasted longer than than the general assumption. So that started to tip the balance when you're, you know, if you're talking about like averaging everything out, then there's, you know, then there's a descent, right? And then mm -hmm. it starts to move the balance over. So there's now. Um, some movement towards understanding it uh, and is understanding uh, psychiatric drug withdrawal in a, in, a, in a larger sense, perhaps uh, in the context of uh, psychotropic withdrawal syndromes in general. They're not a protected, antidepressants, for instance, are not a protected class. You know, the, the, you know heroin has a withdrawal syndrome and antidepressants have withdrawal syndromes. Um, so, um, so there are papers coming out about this. I kind of, you know, I've learned actually, I, I was very naive, but it turns out that this field of publishing, academic publishing is very competitive. So I'm not going to reveal too many details. Yeah, it is. No, but thank you for just talking about it a little bit. It's good. Yeah, yeah. so more is in the pipeline. Um, you know, there have already been several papers derived from my website. I'm hoping that there will be more derived from my website. Uh, and um, there are actually quite a few PhD theses that are looking at my website as an example of a subculture. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because uh, really you have case studies of people that were taking psychiatric drugs and tapered off and they use a certain method and all the data is there to show. I mean, even me, I did a journal on a different website, but it shows like, this is how I feel today. This is tomorrow. This is the next, you know? So over time you can watch a person in their own yeah. words, explain what's happening to them, right? Exactly. Longitudinal, which is very, very important in, in medicine to understand the, the progress of a condition. Mm -hmm. So, so it, my website contains these, uh, I, I mean, you could call them case histories that uh, extend over years. Mm -hmm. uh, follow people from, you know, possibly from the end of their tapering through withdrawal syndrome uh, and po possibly even uh, to recovery. We, we have uh, probably a couple hundred cases of recovery now. Wow, that's great. Yeah. 
So I think that's the last of my questions that I had for us. So now we have a few comments and questions from the audience. And again, if you have a question for Alto, please type it below and uh, we'll get to it. We have about 20 minutes left. So the first question is, is anxiety curable or will it come back after quitting antidepressants? Boy, that's, you know, I am, I don't diagnose or treat people. Um, my, you know, my personal belief is that there's a lot of neurological variability. You know, that's like, that's what sexual reproduction does for the human race is there's, you know, creates a lot of variety. So people, you know, the, people have different nervous systems and, um, you, you know, you, we, we live lives that humans did not really, you know, humans did not adapt to the types of lives that we lead. Uh, you know, we, we didn't evolve for these lives. And I think that for some people, there are some aspects that make, make them quite anxious. And there's mm -hmm. right now in the world, there's a lot to make anyone anxious. Um, but I think that some people are extremely sensitive to this. Now, uh, is it curable? Um, you know, I know that there are people who have uh, done incredible things with, uh, let's say, by learning, let's say, meditation to calm their uh, nervous systems down. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also very helpful when you have withdrawal syndrome to calm your nervous system because you have these, again, surges, these chem this chemical anxiety, and that's your nervous system in an uproar and people actually do manage this with the with techniques that uh, uh, come from meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, the, when you say curable, when you say anxiety conditions and curable, uh, the, um, there are extremes that, you know, for all I know may need some intervention for management, but most of us, most humans will fall in the middle and you, there may be some ways that you could manage uh, anxiety without drugs. Now, as you're coming off of antidepressants, if you have a rise in your anxiety, it's extremely possible that that's a withdrawal symptom and not a return of your anxiety. Uh, a lot of antidepressants induce anxiety, but you, know, but you would know that when you're taking it. Um, if by any chance you started an antidepressant and you felt that it made you more anxious and your doctor prescribed a benzodiazepine to control that, and you've been taking an antidepressant with a benzodiazepine for years, um, yeah, I, that's, that's sort of a perilous situation because you have both uh, your uh, perhaps internal anxiety and the underlying and the anxiety that's being caused by the drug that's been controlled by the other drug for many years. So you're probably gonna to have to go off of the antidepressant person first and stay on the benzodiazepine for a while to let your nervous system settle down from having been irritated by that antidepressant for so long. Does that make sense? Uh, it's, you know, that, that, that unfortunately that's where a lot of uh, people with anxiety are these days is that there might be taking multiple drugs and because one of them, you know, one or more of them cause um, adverse effects and then they get controlled by another drug and there's often a benzodiazepine in the mix, which is gonna be hard to taper as well. Yeah, and that kind of leads into our next question comment. I'm gonna to try to keep it not specific because this person was kind of specific, but what happens, and I'm sure you see this a lot on uh, surviving antidepressants, people are on multiple drugs. It's very rare to, for someone to be only on one thing, right? So um, it's common that they're on multiple drugs. Yeah. And so how do you know, like if you come off of one and you still have the other on board, do you need to come off all of them? Or how do you know when is when one withdrawal syndrome and another begin? Like, it's just a mess, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a mess. So the, okay. So, so we, we follow, I, I was very fortunate, uh, by the way, in my journey to meet a sympathetic psychiatrist who had some tips. So, you know, I call him my mentor and he, uh, 
he said his um, way of thinking was that if you're if you're on a mix of drugs, uh, usually they can they can be um, grouped loosely into accelerators and brakes. And brakes, um, obviously benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, sleep drugs, these slow you down. Um, uh, Lamotrigine, um, you know, th those are drugs that are supposed to slow you down. Antidepressants and um, the uh, stimulants are accelerators. Uh, some people find that antidepressants also make them sleepy, so antidepressants could be breaks or accelerators, but for most people they're stimulating. And um, so what you want to do is to come off of the accelerators first, because the um, upset that's caused by withdrawal, uh, the, the breaks can help subdue the upset that may be caused by withdrawal. Now we advocate an extremely gradual tapering method and to taper only one drug at a time uh, so that you don't get confused about what, where withdrawal symptoms are coming from. Uh, we have a t the reason that we, we, we advocate a very gradual tapering method is to minimize withdrawal symptoms. Uh, we, uh, the, a withdrawal symptom is a sign that your, your nervous system is really having trouble coping with the change and you don't wanna push that too far. So we, we do not add, we tell people not to taper if they're having withdrawal symptoms. So we have people that, you know, that may taper for, you know, like maybe they're tapering uh, uh, Cymbalta and they get down to half of a capsule and then they, uh, they start getting withdrawal symptoms from the decreases, they can just, stop tapering for a while and let everything settle. And then often they can progress with their taper after that. So, so we're not, we don't want you to overlap, you know, one decrease after another, if you're tapering, cause that's just going to make a, a with, if you're having withdrawal symptoms, it will make your withdrawal symptoms worse. Uh, it can be a very, very slow process. So, so, our folks don't have overlapping withdrawal symptoms, but they have, you know, they're, they're tapering one drug at a time. Um, if by any chance they come on the site and they have been tapering multiple drugs simultaneously, that is a, um, that's a, it's real difficult to, to figure out what to do for them because if, if they've gotten into that kind of a situation, they have withdrawal symptoms from, you know, possibly three drugs, all you can do really is to stop tapering everything and see see if stuff settles down. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you can't tell what where the withdrawal symptoms are. Sure. Yeah, and I th I think the person was also kind of hinting to my own situation where it's like I came off antidepressants, antipsych, you know, all these other drugs first, and I saved my benzo for last. And then when you come off of everything, you're like, okay, am I in benzo withdrawal? Am I an antidepressant withdrawal? What am I like? What? But there's no way to ever know. You never know. The nervous system was just changed and now it's having a hard time changing back. It's really pickles and oranges trying to decide what drug did what, you know? I mean, it's all one nervous system. So, you know, so every time you make a change to it, everything, you know, your nervous system has to readjust. It's like, it's like a, uh, it's like a tower of Jenga, you know, it's like you pull one thing out and, you know, like it, you, you don't want to pull some, you don't want to, you don't want to, um, uh, uh, make the, you know, make the whole thing teeter. It's, you know, I have to be really careful about that. Uh, however, uh, if you came off the benzo last, it's because of the way benzos work, it's likely that if you took the benz, if you uh, re, re uh, if, you, if you took a bit of benzo again, it's likely to help, but uh, it's no way. terrifying. <laughs> no, you know, most people no. don't want to do that. No. I don't want to mess anything up. No, but um, okay. So there's this really, really, really good question that I absolutely have to ask you because it's, but it's the last question. So I apologize for jumping in line, but I want to make sure we get to it and then I'll backtrack to the other questions. 
here it is, you ready? Do antidepressants have a, a place in long-term treatment of anxiety and or depression or should people not be taking them? Um, well, this is kind of like the, you know, the question is like, sort of like, uh, you know, do, do psychiatric disorders exist, right? So the, I don't diagnose or treat, so I'll tell you something, I don't know. I can't say that. I, you know, as I say, there are. Ex I believe that that there's a wide variety of neurological configurations, and we have we live in a difficult world, and it could be that there are some neurological configurations that just cannot cannot handle it. Uh, so I, you know, I, I never say never. I mean, there's, you know, there, there are so many billions of people in the world. Um, it's very possible that there are people who actually need it. Uh, so, but I don't, I cannot tell you who those people are. And, yeah. frankly, you know, your doctors and doctors not very good at identifying those people either. So consequently, they tend to over prescribe. I like your answer though, that your, your, your humility that like, I don't know the answers, you know, and, and it makes me think of the other thing is that we don't know who is going to have a withdrawal syndrome and who will not. Mm -hmm. So those are all things, you know, that we, in the film, we try to bring awareness to like informed choice that you learn about the risks, the benefits and the alternatives, and you make the decision for yourself. We're not going to say no, nobody should ever take you know, but it does concern me when I see headlines like during the pandemic, there's been a 30% increase in benzos and 41% of antidepressants. And I, I always ask myself, like, what did the doctor tell the person before they took their first pill, you know? Right, right. I, on my website, <clears throat> you know, we tell people they don't have to go off a drug entirely if they just want to minimize the dosage. Right. Uh, that's, you know, that's, it, it's your choice what you want to do. Um, and for a lot of people, if they feel that, uh, you know, maybe they've been on some combination of drugs for many years and they've always felt that it's been, the effects have been overwhelming, but they still feel like they need, they need the drugs. If they, you know, very gradually reduce the dosages and get down to minimum effective dosages, they might be able to experience whatever benefits they think they get from the drugs without the side effects. Mm. So, so uh, because um, adverse effects are related to dosage and if you lo lower the dosage, you're going to reduce in most cases, the intensity of an adverse effect. Uh, so, uh, so we're very much about a harm reduction ap approach where you, we're, we don't push anybody to go off drugs entirely. If you wanna stay on your uh, you know, psychiatric regimen, your, your drug regimen, you can stay on it. And if you just want to reduce some of it, you can reduce some of it. Oh, I love it. So the next, I'm going to say, uh, wait here, where did my window go? Oh, so here's one comment. And then there's a question from someone else. So I'll just say one of the comments. So the comment is the approval process for new drugs seem, ho seems hopelessly broken and we need to greatly rethink it. Somehow the incentive to approve things we really don't understand has to be curtailed. Healthcare shouldn't be so profitable, really not at all. So they're just kind of speaking to the profitability, you know, that pharmaceutical companies make money when they, anyway, so it's just, it's just a comment. And then here's a question. Uh, it's about protracted withdrawal. What is going on in protracted withdrawal? Protracted means longer than 18 months, let's just say. And do people heal long term? I don't know. Can you talk about that? Okay. Um, what I okay. This is my opinion. <laughs> um, not much. First of all, in what what we know about protracted withdrawal mostly comes from addiction medicine because protracted withdrawal has been ex widely denied and uh, psychiatry. So, um, so there's been, you know, there, there's sort of an artificial wall between addiction medicine and, and psychiatric medicine. And, um, the, the, uh, so, so it's been the, the, the peer support groups, the patient groups that really know 
you know, they, they, that have studied, I guess you could say, protracted withdrawal. That's where um, the information comes from now. Um, in uh, addiction medicine, the model is this, that the um, acute withdrawal is the initial phase of withdrawal. And when the, in addiction medicine, the, there's been sort of a tradition of ver a relatively rapid uh, uh, tapering schedules over perhaps six weeks when you're in an um, addiction medicine facility and uh, because that's all that you're paying for, you know, so they're going to get you off in six weeks, whether you have withdrawal symptoms or not. And uh, so you get, you go, you go through a um, fairly rigid tapering regimen and you might have really kind of terrible withdrawal symptoms while you're tapering and then you get off and then you have really <laughs> severe withdrawal symptoms <laughs> and the, that phase of that initial phase of withdrawal symptoms once you go off is called the acute phase and in and what is thought to be happening is that all of these each of these psychotropics has a target uh let's say for um ssris antidepressants that would be uh, the serotonin receptor, and then gets downregulated as you know, as long as you're taking the drug. And then when you go off of the drug, uh, that target receptor normalizes. It you know it goes it it, it it tries it fixes itself as much as it can, and that's the acute phase. And in, in addiction medicine, people are you know spasming and vomiting and so forth and uh and i believe that in the in, you know relative to antidepressants that's a phase where people are having brain zaps and they also might be vomiting and so forth and so on and then after about throughout uh, uh, across psychotropics uh after about one one week to two months the acute phase there's a transition into a slightly different um, symptom pattern, and that's the post-acute phase. So, so, the, so the initial phase, the acute phase, has to do with the uh, target receptor readapting or partially readapting, and then the post-acute phase is nobody knows exactly what's going on, but probably what's happening is that the rest of your neuro neurological composition and your and all your entire body biology that's dependent on it is also readjusting so so that's what's going on i believe in the post acute or prolonged withdrawal phase mm -hmm. that your it, the target receptors are not the uh, you know not the cause of those symptoms it's everything else that's um, trying to readjust to the new non-drug situations because those drugs affect everything in your body. Yeah. Uh, is, does, ha, really I, good. That was really good. I've never heard it articulated that way. So I think that was really helpful. Yep. And then, okay, so we're going to do one more question and then we're going to wrap up because we're coming up on time. And the last one is a good one, one I often think about. So there's a phenomenon for the audience that doesn't know this, there's a phenomenon called uh, kindling. So in benzodiazepine withdrawal or alcohol withdrawal, if the person goes on and off multiple times, their nervous system becomes so destabilized that the next withdrawal is worse than the last. So this person's question is, do antidepressants also kindle the nervous system? Uh my belief is that a history of going on and off psychiatric drugs does make your nervous system more vulnerable to a hypersensitivity that can lead to kindling. Mm -hmm. So uh, on my website, you'll see me often talking about hypersensitivity, and that's what I'm talking about. Can you define uh, define hypersensitivity for the audience that doesn't you know, know? You know, it's the same idea that you know, like you make all of these chemical changes, and your your nervous system is trying to keep up with them, and it gets confused, and it becomes 
oh, it becomes hyper reactive to, to new inputs. So, you know, I mean, you know, let's say very typically uh, people will, uh, their doctors will switch them from one antidepressant to another because they're trying to find something that works. And um, every single time you make one of those switches, if, you're, if your nervous system has had, had time to adapt to the drug, which will happen within a couple of months, you're, you're upsetting the apple cart over and over again. So, the, you know, so every time you make that switch, your nervous system has to adapt to a new drug and it's like, it doesn't, it, it doesn't instantly adapt. And so all kinds of circuits get, you know, confused and, and you may find as the time goes on that your adverse effects keep on getting worse and worse and worse. And that's because your, your system is not able to manage and to, to, to adapt to these chemical changes like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the further you go down this road of confusing your nervous system, it gets more and more snarled and it gets to the point where anything you put in is going to be a problem. And this has to, and, and people who, um, who uh, have kindling from benzos find that they, uh, you know, very small amounts of benzos will cause a paradoxical reaction. Um, I actually experienced that myself because, uh, you know, in my, the course of my journey, I had at one time tried benzos and I wasn't even able to handle a tiny chrome of diazepam. So, so, uh, so that, that's the hyper, your, 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 your nervous system becomes hyper reactive or hypersensitive to these inputs because it just doesn't want any more inputs. It's already trying to figure things out. Sorry. So while we're wrapping up, uh, would you please tell people how to find you or your website, anything you want to say about um, what you do? Well, um, survive, survivingantidepressants.org is uh, available on the web. Um, if you want counseling, you would have to register and uh, start a topic about yourself. And that's how I can be reached through the website. Um, generally speaking, uh, I prefer to uh, interact with people in the public topics, not through email, because I, otherwise I would have hundreds of people. Yeah. Send email. So, so um, also uh, Surviving Antidepressants has a lot of information that you can just read for yourself without having to register. Excellent. All right, so one more time, I'm gonna plug our store for Medicating Normal. We just put up a store. It's only gonna be open for about three more weeks. We need to sell 100 t-shirts in order to print the t-shirts. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because we're, we're right now translating the film into multiple languages. We just did Turkish, Portuguese, and Spanish, French. We are working on German, Hebrew, and Czech from Czechoslovakia. And each, each one costs three to $500 a piece. So that's just one example of the expenses that we have. We also have website fees, platform fees for Zoom, uh, screening fees, all kinds of stuff, like so much more than you would even imagine that goes into doing a film. So if you're in a place where you'd like to support us with buying either a sticker or a t-shirt, or you'd like to make a bigger donation, please go to our website. There's a little tab that says store and another little tab that says donate. Again, the website is medicatingnormal.com. And lastly, if you haven't seen the film Medicaid Normal yet, there is multiple screenings listed on our website and that's under the watch tab. So again, that's medicatingnormal.com slash watch. Uh, our next interview is on November 3rd at 1 p.m. And it's going to be Dr. Mark Horowitz, who is very good friends with Alto. So um, that'll be a joy to have him. And lastly, if you have any suggestions for another person that you think we should interview or you think that, um, I don't know that you want to hear from just let us know drop a comment below or send us a message and again thank you so much for your audience thank you alto for for joining us i could talk to you for hours i'm just fascinated i feel like this is a revolutionary conversation that needs to be had where these these patients i mean we've we've all have this collective wisdom that's so rich and um i don't know i think it's a beautiful thing to watch peer support happening other people helping more than I mean, because you go to the doctor, it's only maybe a 10 minute appointment, but the rest of the week and all those hours in the middle of the night, these people are online helping each other get through the hardest time of their life. You know, it's pretty amazing.
Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. An hour is too short, Angela. It is too short. Oh, it just went by so fast. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll talk again. Thank All right. Bye-bye, everyone.